Okay, well, the word for the week is testimony, okay? Testimony is the word for the week. And testimony, we know what testimony is. Um, you, you go in a court and you testify as a witness. You go in and you put on the stand and uh, you have to do your thing. Testimony. John writes his gospel with the express intention that people should believe that Jesus is God the Son. That's the point. And also, secondly, that by believing they should have life in his name. He says that in John chapter 20. He he's up front about it. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is why I'm writing what I'm writing. I am writing with the express intention, says John, that people should believe that Jesus is God the Son and that by believing they should have life in his name. All sorts of people. Certainly when I was a young Christian, it was particularly thought that this book was for people of a Greek background. It was thought that it was for people perhaps who had been influenced by um, a sort of an Aristotelian Platonic dualism, so that there's a real world, there's a phenomenal world, and there's, there's, there's all sorts of gradations between the real world and the phenomena that we observe. Um, one is a mirror of the actual reality, which is somewhere else. Uh, and that they led into people thinking that John was written for proto-Gnostics, people who were going to become heretics a century later, really, something that was coming into being a bit later on. We now realise very much this is written with really with Jewish people in mind, but Jewish people living in the Greek world and influenced by its ideas too. And that's why perhaps we get all this stuff at the beginning about John the Baptist. We've got the creator God, we've got those, all those overtones that we've looked at in, in previous weeks of the Genesis account. In the beginning, and everybody's expecting, God created the heavens and the earth from Genesis chapter 1. But instead we've got in the beginning, was the word, pardon, what? Big shock. What are you saying, John? He's writing very much into that Jewish understanding of the world. And, and here he comes with John the Baptist straight away. And that's relevant, um, as, as we'll see. So signs and sayings, they're the big things that John points to, to testify to Jesus being God the Son in the flesh, so that by believing we might have life in his name. The sayings and the signs are the, are the, the big uh, contact points, if you like, with this testimony in John's Gospel. Before that, he deals with the ultimate origins of the Messiah and then the this-worldly origins as John the Baptist comes into, into the frame of human history. John is insisting then that the ultimate origins of the Messiah are as the pre-incarnate Word who was with God and who was God. But, but if ever we needed a reminder that we need to be down-to-earth Christians, here it is. The Gospel, these great big ideas, that the, the pre-incarnate word, fantastic huge theme. The good news starts here. With a man coming to live in the desert as the herald of the Saviour, who himself solidly planted his own sandaled feet into the Palestinian dust. And, and, and was testified to by sons of that very same dust. He is a, a cast iron personality. John the Baptist, boots on the ground, sandals on the ground in those days, right? Christian, keep your feet on the ground. He's a very earthy personality. John the Baptist. And the enfleshing of the mission, giving substance to incarnation. It starts with a man sent from God John the Baptist, God's true witness, verses 6 to 8 of John 1. What happened was a man came. God is burst, God the creator, God the sustainer of all things, is bursting into human history. And here's where it starts. A man came, sent from God, whose name was John. A man came. The expression in the Greek here is, is quite helpful, quite telling. Again, to anthropos, a man came into being. Apestalmanos paratheou, sent by God. Onoma auto Ioannes, his name was John. Three things, simple things. Three things about the one who's going to be the herald of the king's coming. It's all concrete, it's all realistic, and it's all rooted in that Palestinian dust. A man came. John's Gospel is going to be clear about this. The person that we're dealing with here is, yes, utterly exceptional. Yes, utterly singular. 
but he's a man. And there's the contrast, there's the contrast John points at the beginning with the light who's coming. The light who's coming is the pre-incarnate word who created, was there with the creator in the beginning and was himself creator God. And there's this huge contrast with this earthy, down to earth character, John who comes and stands in the desert and preaches his sermons. There's a huge contrast. Nothing much said here of John's ancestral origins, Luke does that. Nothing much said here of John's character, Luke does that too. This John that's writing takes for granted that the reader knows who John the Baptist was. In every dimension that was valued by his contemporaries, he takes for granted we know who are you, where do you live, where, where are you from. He takes for granted we know that, he just says John. A man came, sent from God, his name was John. John knows his readership have got all the background info, it's one of the later Gospels. But they've also got issues of semi-divinities and half-gods, half-man stuff floating around in their background. All that proto-gnosticism they have to contend with and deal with. Who was John the Baptist? Don't even need to call him the Baptist. They well knew his character. Even if they needed aspects of his significance clarified, this is the man who's called John. John's Gospel doesn't even call him John the Baptist. You know who we're talking about here. It's John. A man came sent from God. John is a godsend. Now, not all the religious authorities would recognise that. They could not grasp that. They could not get hold of it at all. But he's a man who had come because he was sent by God. And that's a, that's a huge thing to say about any human being. Um, biblically, it is. In being commissioned like that, John is placed in the same category as men like Moses, Exodus 3, 10 to 15. Dynamically sent and empowered by God. If you're sent in God's name, you come and you've got to be taken seriously. You're a serious person. The prophets, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Jeremiah 1, 4 following, they were serious guys. They were guys to contend with because they had been sent by God, who is somebody serious to contend with indeed. As we said very often, um, the prologue is the preface. And the theme of the Baptist witness is picked up, it's expanded in verses 19 to 34, and then chapter 3, verses 27 to 30. You know, John's prologue, which we're looking at, um, has set, kicks off little themes and they're picked up and expanded later on. The prologue is the preface to what's coming in so many ways. He comes as one sent by God, as a testimony ordained by God in its proper time. The important thing, says Merrill Tenney, about John the Baptist is that he was sent. Part of the package of the mission of Jesus, sent as the herald, as the forerunner, announcing and authenticating the coming of the King. And that's a big deal that God should send him. You, you need to set that against the historical background. Uh, that, that the particular historical backdrop of, of this event. In the first place, it occurs against the paralyzing backdrop of 400 years of silence from God. God has not sent anybody in this way for 400 years. So God rescued his people from the famine in the land by taking them down to Egypt. And there Joseph, via a fairly rocky road, found favor with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. But in due course, Joseph and his brothers died. And the Pharaoh changed. And the Hebrews came to look like a huge threat to the umpteenth Pharaoh down the line. So he enslaved them and kept them too busy to stage a coup with building pyramids. Not just building pyramids, but lots of stuff like that. And then there was Moses sent from God. And then there was the Passover and the Exodus and the wandering through the wilderness because of lack of faith, because of rebellion and because of sin. And this becomes a theme in the history of the people of God. Because then there's the conquest of Canaan and the united monarchy. And God's repeated faithfulness is met with sin upon sin. And so thick became the sin, so rebellious the people, that he warned them and he punished them, he warned them, he punished them. He restored them time after time, winning them back repeatedly to himself, only for them to turn away again until finally God pulled back. God just withdrew. You want to do this on your own? Try working it out for yourselves. 
And for 400 years, God was silent and the oppression and the terror of his silence was more than his people could bear. And after that 400 years, God sent John. And John took them straight back to basics, the last, the summarizing Old Testament prophet. And he preached a baptism, which was new, for repentance from sins, which was the consistent theme of history. God's latest, most supreme act of mercy, that after so long in silence, as it were, almost on the naughty step, God reached out to his rebellious and wayward people again. So here he comes. John. A man sent from God. A godsend. After 400 years of punitive silence from God because his people had proved so uniquely unable to listen when he sought to lead them and give them life. And that man coming, being sent, the point of this prophet coming, God isn't going back to the old system, call them back again and hope they get it right this time, that approach that's lasted several thousand years so far, call them back, hope they get it right. The point of John's being sent, the point of this new prophet coming, is to herald a new era that will solve that old cycle of sin and recovery, sin and recovery, solve it once and for all and build an utterly new, utterly new basis for the family of God. Repent, believe, have your sin fully atoned for by the blood of Christ. Receive the indwelling spirit who gives you the inner strength to walk increasingly in God's ways. The man who comes, the herald who comes for all of that stuff, that new package that's coming, he's clearly identified to them here as John. Not John the Baptist, John. Wasn't an unusual name. It's as if John the Apostle, who's writing this gospel, had said, you know who I'm talking about, John. Who? Well, Luke tells us more. Luke being earlier. Written earlier. Luke tells us that during the reign of Herod, king of Judea, there, were, there was a priest, and his name was Zechariah. And he belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And his wife, also a daughter of a Levite, was called Elizabeth. And they're both righteous in the sight of God. It's a godly home. And they follow all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. And they do so blamelessly as far as anybody knew. But they didn't have a child. Because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both very old. But, you know, there's no retirement for Levites. And Zachariah was serving as a priest before the Lord according to the, the, the rota, the rosters of the day and according to the custom of the priesthood they drew lots to see who would go into the sanctuary and offer the incense and they drew lots and it was his go so he entered the holy place of the Lord to burn incense he's an old guy perhaps it was going to be the last chance ever and the whole crowd of people were praying outside at the hour of the incense offering at the angel of the Lord stood on the right side of the altar of incense and appeared to him and obviously he was vis visually shaken, he, he was seized with fear and he shook. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and you're going to have a son. Elizabeth is going to give you a son and you're going to call him John. That John. And joy and gladness will come to you and many will rejoice at his birth. Why? Because he'll be great in the sight of the Lord and he must never drink. Wine, strong drink, he'll be filled with the Spirit even before his birth. And here's what he's for, verse 16 of Luke 1. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He will turn many people to the Lord their God. And he will go ahead of the Lord, before the Lord, the forerunner. And he will do so in the Spirit and the power of Elijah, that great prototypical Old Testament prophet. And he'll turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people who are prepared for him. And now you're going to be silent. Because you couldn't believe it. 
You'll be silent and able to speak until the day these things take place. And then the child is born. And on the eighth day, they come to circumcise the child and give him a name. And Elizabeth says, we're going to call him John. And they say, what? You can't call him John. None of your relatives are called John. How can you? Pfft, ridiculous. What sort of name is John? And so they, 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 they bring the father in on this. It's the father's prerogative, really, but he's dumb. So they, uh, they give him a tablet to write on. And John is the name that Zechariah writes on the tablet. His name is John. And as soon as, as soon as that happens, he can speak and he praises God. And everybody is filled with fear at this miracle they've seen. And everybody's talking about it. And they say, what will this child be? The Lord's hand is indeed with him. John. A man came from God, sent from God, whose name was John. A concrete, known person. God breaking into the here and now, ending 400 years of painful silence and distance from God. That guy, you know him, John. Crucial guy in the coming kingdom of God. So John's function then gets spelled out very clearly in the next verse, verse 7. The true witness, a man sent from God, his name was John, the true witness. Verse 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that everyone might believe through him. Do you know, we've said he's come as the final and summarizing Old Testament prophet. There's no other Old Testament prophet whose role is described in those terms. Times, terms anything like that. He's come as a witness. He's come to testify about the light so that everyone might believe through him. John came. He was sent as a witness. And that word witness is a very important word in John's gospel. It's especially important in this gospel. It's a determined attempt to establish a clear case, as this gospel, by adequate testimony for the claims of Jesus to be believed to be Son of God. And the gospel starts with this, and the gospel ends with it. Testimony, the word for the week, is witness, is testimony. It comes to testify, to testify to the light, and we'll come to that. And he comes to testify to the light to enable belief. The purpose of John's testimony, not of course its result, was that through him all men might believe. John 1, 35 to 37 provides one instance where John's witness was not only effective but particularly fruitful in its outcome. Because just a little further down the page, John 1, 35 to 7, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And two of John's own followers left and went to follow Jesus. That's the way it's going to be. It was tough being a prophet in those days. Now John's being very clear with us. There's been a lot of speculation about this, but John in verse 8 is very clear. He himself was not the light. John the Baptist was not the light. He came to testify about the light. And there's been a lot of speculation that John wrote his gospel specifically to uh, refute the idea that John the Baptist was, uh, was the last word from God. Certainly it's clear from Acts 19, 1-7, at Ephesus, Paul came across people there during the course of his preaching that were not aware of the Gospel, nor of the work of the Spirit, but who had only known the baptism of John. Word hadn't got out yet about Jesus and the crucifixion and Pentecost. Obviously hadn't got as far as Ephesus to some of these people. John may have had something of that sort in mind, but generally he writes extremely positively of John the baptizer. So it's perfectly adequate to see the point of verse 8 as simply preparing the way for verse 9, which makes the main point that John has in mind here. He's focusing on the true light who is coming into the world. And John's job is to point to him. John comes along. John is the true and faithful witness to the coming of the light. Verses 9 to 10, Jesus is the true light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was created by him, but the world did not recognize him. True light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light is the emphasis of this verse. Alethinos is the word that's used. It means real or genuine, not a copy, certainly not second hand. The true light. 
was coming into the world. Christ is not some proto-gnostic demiurge, if you're into that sort of thing. Not some phenomenal, as opposed to essential light, real light. He is the real light of humanity, who is about to enter the world. Now, any reader of the Old Testament would know that the law and also wisdom give light, because the Old Testament says that. But chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus, the Word, who came into the world, is the light. He is the true light. He is the ultimate disclosure of God to man. He's the real light. You want to see something? You want to see? Yeah. He's the light. You want to see God? He's the one who brings God to light. You want to see the way ahead for you? He is the light. He's come into the world as a light. The true light who gives light to everyone who comes into the world. He is the light who comes into the world, shines light, and gives light. Crucial issue. He is the light who gives light. He created it in verse, four, verse 3 of chapter 1. He shines it in verse 4 of chapter 1. He conveys it in verse 5 of chapter 1. He made the light. He makes it now. So if you're going to get it, it'll be coming from him. He is the true light and he shines it, he gives it by coming into the world. It's an important word there, another important theme word for John. Testimony is an important theme word. Um, the world is an important theme word for John as well. John's Gospel. Uh, some people have argued that the word world is often positive in John. God so loved the world. So it must be nice then. Well, it's also sometimes a neutral word, simply a big place that can hold a lot of books. John chapter 21, verses 24 to 5. You know, if everything he did were to be written, then the whole world couldn't contain all the books, says John about Jesus. But generally, the world in John is overwhelmingly negative. The world as a Johannine concept does not refer to the totality of creation, generally, but to the world of human beings and the world of human affairs, generally, in a way, that describes the way that the world is organized in rebellion against God. It organizes itself in rebellion against its creator. You need to look more closely at references said to be uh, positive about the world. Although God so loved the world, he gave his only son, the love is to be admired not because the world is so big, but because the world is so bad says Carson. The true light has come into the darkness of this present evil age, this dark world, and if Jesus appears as the saviour of the world, that says a great deal that's good about Jesus, but nothing positive at all about the world. But please notice this about the way John phrases it. In the world he was, that sounds a bit like uh, Yoda, doesn't it? You know, he was, but that's the way Greek syntax works, okay? In the world he was, and the world was made or came into being through him. It had its origin in him. In the world he was, and the world had its origin in him, but the world, him, didn't know. Didn't know. Jesus appears not only as the Messiah, by, who, by means of whom uh, an, an eschatological future is anticipated, as in, as in the synoptics. He comes as an envoy from the heavenly world into this world of reality, this material world. And the world God created has gone so far in its rebellion against him, so far down the road of worshipping created things rather than the creator God, who is above all forever praised, so far that when the creator comes, they don't know what he looks like. Unrecognised. He was in the world. And the world was created by him. But the world did not recognize him. This is weird. Imagine this scenario. Um, I'm, I'm grasping at ways to try and illustrate. Can you imagine James Dyson, you know, revolutionary Hoover man, not Hoover, vacuum cleaner, got to say it like that. 
Can you imagine James Dyson walking into the Dyson factory and only getting as far as the gate? Sorry, sir, do you have a security pass? <laughs> what? Did you have an appointment at all? Does anyone here know you who will vouch for you in any way? And at that point, up steps John the Baptist. Somebody comes from the inside and bears testimony. Jesus came right up close to his creation. You could look into the pupils of his eyes. And people who did that, two people who did that, he remained completely unrecognised. How strange. So long spent serving created things rather than the creator God. They just didn't recognise him. He came right close, unrecognised. As the creator, unrecognised. John shows us repeatedly Jesus doing things that we know as the signs of the Messiah in John's Gospel. That's what they call technically. John is very much about sayings and signs that authenticate Jesus as God the Son with the purpose that those reading should believe. But repeatedly you come away thinking that what Jesus has done is to exercise on his very own initiative the power that belongs to God. This is the creator God who can turn water into wine. Who else can do that with a word of command? This is the creator God who commands the healing of a man who, whose sin, he says, is just forgiven. This is the creator God who heals the son of the official from Cana in Galilee, but again, by his word of command, not even a house visit. And on and on and on it goes. The sick man by the pool of Bethsaida, deliberately healing him without the use of the usual means there. In John 5. Exercising the authority of God, acting like the eternal creator, being despised and rejected like the man of sorrows that Isaiah predicted. And then even the evidence of his rejection begins to corroborate the authenticity of the Saviour. Even as this darkling world rejects him. He was a true witness, was John, to the true light, verses 9 to 10, who came into the world unrecognised. The world organised on the basis of its idolatry of created things rather than the worship of its creator God, did not recognise its creator and light, did not recognise. The, the, new, uh, the New English translation has recognised, the word is egno, uh, to, to learn, to know, to come to know, to get a knowledge of, to perceive, to feel, to become known to, to understand. The world, humanity, organised in rebellion against God, just didn't recognise its creator and its light. All this before their very eyes. And the darkness had so taken over the world into which he came that it still didn't recognise the light shining in it. Some closed their eyes so as not to see it. Some focused all their attention on the torch, not the light that issued from it. Religion is still a killer when organised without reference to the living God. Some simply didn't recognise the light as being light. Wanted to call it something else. Whichever way it is, people don't recognise the light that is so evident in Christ, the Creator, who created light, still gives it. They don't believe the testimony. They don't recognise the light that's there in Christ in and of himself. They don't recognise that what Christ actually gives is light. So many just see the torch, but not the light. And what do you reckon is the solution to that?
the word for the week is testimony. <laughs> and you, you've got it. You've got it in this passage of Scripture. The solution to this situation is the testimony of people, real people, who've got their feet in the Palestinian dirt that do believe in Him. And by their testimony, by the reality of their God in their life, by the reality of the true light taking up residence in them, the daily life lived in the fellowship of Jesus. By that, they accredit the power and the salvation of God by wearing their heart on their sleeve. By wearing the heart that Jesus has been working in and Jesus has been changing, where people can see it, with its failure, with its difficulty, with its challenges and perhaps even its doubts and fears, but on their sleeve. So that the genuine reality of Jesus can be seen. That the light that he brings into my dark life becomes real in this real darkling world. What's the solution to it? The solution to them not recognizing the light who comes is you, his followers, and the reality of your life lived in fellowship with him. And I, I am sure you feel very imperfect about the life you live in fellowship with him. But, but really that is an essential part of your testimony to him. Because what he does is he comes and he takes on very imperfect and broken people like you and me. And we need to let that be known too. Because he's a very gracious God. Showing love and care and bringing light into the lives of some very uh, imperfect people like you and me. Here's the challenge. The challenge is to you and to me to be the person whose heart and life so really is changed by God that they will see light in us. His light, not ours, His light in us. So that we become the evidence they're prepared to accept. Rebels? Yes. Failures? Yes. People broken by our experience of trying to live life in rebellion against God? Yes, we've done it to ourselves. But one in whose heart the light of Christ has begun to shine. And that heart needs to be worn on this sleeve. So that as he puts his life into our cracked pots, the light shines out through the cracks and draws people to his light.